Hello, welcome everybody. I am Christiana Limniatis. I'm Director of Preservation Services for Preservation Buffalo Niagara. Thank you so much for joining us tonight for our second lecture of the modern WNY 2020. Uh, tonight we're talking about North Tonawanda's Memorial Pool, uh, all about it and the other pools that are similar to it. Um, we are here on Zoom right now. So everyone who is on Zoom, if you can just make sure that your microphones and video are turned off so that we can spend uh, the rest of our time together uh, taking in all of the beautiful photographs and information that we're about to go over. We're also live streaming this event onto Facebook. So if you're on Facebook, um, you can use the comment section to ask any questions if you'd like. And certainly here on Zoom, use that chat function to ask any questions. Uh, I would love any and all questions, so don't be shy about that. I have my coworker Tabitha here with us this evening to catch those questions and serve as moderator. So she'll be able to interrupt and let me know when you guys have some questions. Let us get started, shall we? If my computer will want to go to the next slide, yes. Before we talk about the fantabulous pool that is in North Tonawanda, um, let us, uh, oops, sorry. Um, let me introduce you to Preservation Buffalo Niagara if you are new to us as an organization. We are your local preservation advocacy organization. Our mission is to identify, protect, and promote our unique architecture and historic legacy and connect people to the places they love here in Western New York. Our name has Buffalo and Niagara in it, but our service area is much wider than that. We actually provide services to the five westernmost counties of New York State. So we have a very broad mission, a very broad service area. How do we provide services to our area? And that is by dividing our work into four main categories. So we have education, technical service, advocacy, and community development. Education tonight is an example of that, whether it's virtual or in person. We love presenting you information to help you better understand your historic built environment and then therefore be able to help preserve and protect it. Technical service, PBN staff is available to answer any of your questions related to your preservation adventure, whether it's a material question about how to fix a particular element of a property or resource or how to go about um, repairing something like that or it can be preservation planning questions. So if you need help preparing a national register nomination or a local landmark nomination or doing your historic tax credit application, we are here to provide guidance. And when it comes to advocacy and community development, they're basically the same thing. Advocacy is where we take the lead in whatever that issue is. We're taking the lead in uh, trying to save a particular resource or nominate a resource or advocate for legislation that will support preservation work. And community development is where we come to you and make sure that you have the tools and uh, ideas and information you need to be in charge of your own preservation destiny. Like I said, we have five counties in our service area, so it is absolutely impossible for us to be at every meeting in front of every racking ball. So we need to make sure that you have what you need to preserve and advocate for your own built environment. Um, and who is the we at PBN that I am talking about? It is these smiling faces in an office I know that we are all longing to return to. Our executive director is Jesse Fisher. Um, there's me, Mary Begley, Tia Brown, Tabitha O'Connell, and Bridge Roush round, round out the team. And that's Tabitha, who is our little voice of God collecting any questions that you guys might have throughout the night. All right, so we are on to the topic at hand. North Tonawanda's Memorial Pool. This incredibly interesting structure is what's called a Bintz Pool, B-I-N-T-Z. It's an ovoid, an egg-shaped, entirely above ground structure containing all of the accoutrements of a pool, the locker rooms, the showers, the toilets, the mechanics of that pool within that ring around the pool itself. The Bintz pools were um, especially suited for urbanized environments because they could be designed to accommodate a variety of interesting topography and, and strict con con uh, lot parameters. So you could really kind of plop it wherever you needed to in your urbanized environment when you might not have had the room to build something more elaborate. Um, 
There, this type of pool is found uh, across the country. Um, they were built between the 1920s and the 1950s. Uh, the estimates kind of vary around. Um, some people say that there, you, usually people say there's around 130 of them. I've seen estimates and notes that there might be as many as 170, as little as 100. But unfortunately, there isn't the massive national survey that we need to really confirm that number for us. Um, the pool that we're going to talk about tonight was built in 1948 and the picture that you see on the screen right now was taken probably just soon after its construction was finished, whether at the end of the 40s or maybe even in the early 50s when this photograph was taken. Um, and it's it's labeled in the archives as an aerial photo, but it's really interesting, cool, funny because it's actually just taken from a tree that's close by, as you can see by the shadows of the leaves in front of the lens which is pretty, pretty, pretty cute. Um, we, uh, I would like to say that we were going to initially do this lecture as uh, back in April, uh, not part of our modern WNY programming. It was gonna be a partnership with the North Tonawanda Historic Preservation Commission. And we were just gonna have a pop-up lecture about it. But unfortunately due to COVID, uh, that event had to be canceled. And because of COVID and the closing of a lot of different libraries and museums that we needed to visit to get some really good resources, uh, uh, this entire presentation had to be done just with online sources. So I do just want to do a quick thank you and acknowledgement to some sources that um, I used heavily in putting this program together. Uh, Tegan Bayachi, and I apologize if I'm pronouncing your name incorrectly. She is a historic preservationist and architectural historian who is the unofficial historian for the Bince pools. And um, she's written extensively about them on her own blog and in newspaper interviews and, and other interviews. And so uh, her information has been greatly appreciated and, and helpful in putting this together. There's also many um, internet groups on Facebook and Flickr that have great photographs and other information. There's the Coalition to Save Memorial Pool North Tonawanda on Facebook. There's the Wesley Bince Swimming Pool Network on Facebook. And then there's also the Wesley Bince Swimming Pool group on Flickr. So many of the images that you see here tonight were taken from those groups and I thank you. All right, before we can talk about this pool and all of what makes it super duper fancy, let's just take a little stroll through the history of swimming pools. So swimming pools began as baths as public bathing. Uh, the first example uh, of a public water tank is going to be back into Pakistan into the ancient era, the great bath of the Mojo Darrow. I'm probably saying that wrong. I apologize. Um, according to researchers, it was built for religious ceremonies. But as you can see in this photograph of a dig uh, at it, it was a large um, in ground, you know, below ground um, pool with a a platform and, and terrace around it that allowed for seating areas and, and watching of all manners. Um, it was filled, it was built out of brick, but it was lined with gypsum and a waterproof membrane so that the water wouldn't just dissipate into the ground. So that's really, really fascinating uh, invention that early. Certainly we go into the Greek and Roman era and bath, public baths are a part of those communities. It's the Romans that really kick it into overdrive and make some super duper fancy heated baths. The pictures on the screen that you see, this top one on the right is the Roman baths in Somerset, England. And the picture on the bottom is a Turkish bath from the 16th century in Istanbul. But those are still not swimming pools, they are baths. So how do we get to swimming pools? And the real you know, evolution of modern swimming pools come to us um, you know, really kick off in the 1880s. Uh, 1837, um, there is reports of swimming pools being built in London. None of them have survived. Um, 1868, Boston is the first community or known community in America to have a pool. It was built on Cabot Street. Um, when we get into the Gilded Age and we have all of those absolutely insanely rich people building crazy, crazy mansions in New York City and a lot of other cities in the East Coast, many of those homes also do have pools associated with them, either inside or outside. And so that 
push of those really, really rich people building pools in their house kind of further along technology. Uh, that brings us to 1896 with the modern Olympic Games. And that is really what kicks it into overdrive for the need to create a conventional modern pool and not to just rely on open swimming in open water. I apologize for shuffling around uh, on my screen. I am in charge of letting people into the Zoom room, so don't mean to be distracting. In 1907, Philadelphia gets their first pool um, above ground. And in 1910, the United, there's the first example in the United States of someone trying to use a filtering process to sanitize those bodies of water, those pools. Before that, it would be a matter of needing to drain them on a regular process, regular uh, schedule. But then when we get to 1910 and moving forward, we have this invention of these draining filtration systems. After World War II, pools definitely become a status symbol, not just for a community to have a municipal pu public swimming pool, but for individuals to have their own swimming pools. Whereas in the 1800s during the Gilded Age, it's just crazy rich people that have their own pools. When we get into the post-war era, you're seeing pools being built in you know, middle-class homes, in, in really just regular everyday neighborhoods and not just for the wealthy. Um, one of the uh, key points in the history and evolution of the swimming pool is uh, this middle picture right here, this cover of House Beautiful from, I think the actual printing is from 1949, I believe. Um, but in 1948, landscape architect Thomas Church designs the Donnell Ranch, uh, the, the landscape for the Donnell Ranch, which then produces this pool, the Donnell Pool. It is the epitome of 19... 40s, 50s, California pool design. It's that kidney-shaped pool. And so with the design of that pool and the notoriety and attention that it gets, that really does help shepherd um, the, the popularity and and the desire for pools across the country. Um, there is a fabulous podcast called 99%. It's a design podcast, but many of their um, uh, um, episodes are really preservation heavy and they have one episode that's about the Donald pool and discussing its role in the history and evolution of landscape architecture and pool design, but also because of its critical role in the history and evolution of skateboarding. So everything is connected and I highly recommend that podcast for you. Um, the last thing to mention in the history of swimming pools is this fantabulous word, natatorium. Everyone say it with me, natatorium. <laughs> It is the word that means it's a building containing a swimming pool. Uh, so many of the Vince pools that we're going to talk about today have the word natatorium as part of their title, of their name. Um, a lot of colleges and universities still have this word associated with their pools, um, but it's just a freaking great word, and I wanted to make sure that we all remember it. That's all. Any questions before we move into the story of Vince himself? Excellent. Let us move on to the man, the myth, the pool legend, Wesley Bintz. Uh, that is that handsome devil we see in front of us. He was born in 1891. He attended the University of Michigan uh, for both his bachelor's and his master's degree in architect uh, in engineering. It's, excuse me, graduating in 1916 and 1918, respectively. His first job out of school is as a staff engineer with the city of Flint, Michigan. He stays there for a little bit and then moves on to Lansing, Michigan, where he quickly becomes the chief engineer for the city. In his capacity in that position, he designs the J.H. Moore's Natatorium, so we know it's a pool, um, which is completed in 1923. And that is the prototype of these Vince pools that he will then go on and build for the rest of his life. He builds that pool, quickly files the patent paperwork for it. And then by the end of that year, by the end of 1923, he's resigned his position and is committed to the 
pool life, chasing those champagne wishes and caviar dreams of pool life, right? Um, he continues making pools and his business continues into the 1950s, early, very early 1950s. Um, he then um, passes away in 1967 and he's buried in Lansing, Michigan. The images that we see before us, the large cartoon one on the left hand side was a steady um, uh, column, my, uh, cartoon that was in the Lansing State Journal that highlighted and profiled key uh, Michigan uh, individuals. And so here is the profile they did on Mr. Bince. Um, that center photo is his graduation picture from 1916 yearbook. Um, the photograph with the heart on it uh, is a, a promotional photo that was in a newspaper highlighting how um, he had just signed a new contract with a new city. And then at the top here, this incredibly fabulous design to his letterhead um, that is just incredibly sharp. He was very active in one of the main ways in which he publicized and got the word out and, and sent out his promotional material was just direct letters to the engineering office, the planning office, whatever that municipality called that division to just offer this public works department, here's a cool pool, here's an interesting way to provide this service to your community. So here is that famous prototype, the J.H. Moore's Memorial Natatorium in Lansing, Michigan. It is the first one that he designs. It started in 1922. Um, that's with the date that's on the plaque on the front here. It's completed in June of 1923. It has its opening day to the public on the 25th of the month. Just 11 days before that, he files his patent paperwork with the federal government. So really right from the get-go, he knows that he's he's hit on something, he's got an idea, it's going to take him places. So he immediately files that patent paperwork and, and moves on from this position to start his company. Um, as a, a wise woman once said, get that bread, get that patent and leave. Um, here is a better photograph a little bit far away to kind of show you how this, this pool was kind of built into the topography of Lansing. It's in a built into a hill that you can kind of see. It's a little hard in this photograph, built into the hill, again, showing that it can, it's easy adaptable to urban environments. This photo will um, highlight that a little bit more, this really fabulous archival picture from 1958, I believe it is. So you see how the rear of the pool was just built into the cliff of this park. And then that allowed them to add the stadium seating here uh, for you know passerbyers and, and other family members and whoever else that didn't wanna actually get into the mess of the pool themselves. Uh, so like I said, he filed his patent paperwork um, on June 14th, 1923. Um, it wasn't approved until February 1926, but that's no problem. Um, so the whole point of your patent paperwork is to distinguish how your invention is unique and different from any other uh, variation of that product. And so there isn't that much information contained in the patent paperwork, but what it does discuss thus is the different features on it. So here is the first page image that's included and you have all these handwritten numbers that show the individual features that make it interesting. And so the majority of that patent paperwork is just addressing and focusing on those elements and describing them. But here we see this main kind of introductory paragraph section that's included in the paperwork where he explains how his improvements to the bathing pool is significant and different. So the first thing is that it provides the ability to construct into a hillside or irregular ground with a small amount of excavation. So there really isn't a need to dig a huge pole, a hole to put this pool in. We can really just plop it on top of the ground. Uh, the second and third points are, are basically similar in that not only are, does this allow for all of the necessary um, things like the bathrooms and the dressing rooms and the showers to be included within it, but it's actually within the footprint of the pool. So it saves on space, it saves on money, it's a convenience factor. So it's all just like a one-stop shop to, to pool, to swim, and do all the other things that come along with swimming. Um, and then fourth, 
it is economical structure and also attractive. <laughs> so again, by saving space, by not having to have such a, a huge excavation process, you're just saving money and time and space um, much more than a traditional conventional pool would. Here is kind of a cut away from an aerial photograph looking at that brim, that circle that would go around your pool, um, showing how it's divided up. So half of it would be, uh, say you know used for ladies locker rooms and showers half of it for the men's side um you can see it's very interesting and funny and just shows the difference in times the women's side has really cute little changing stalls um, along with these little grid things are the lockers which then continue to the back of the pool this is the main entrance right here so you walk in you're able to get and change and lock up your belongings there's showers and toilets towards the back and then here are the stairs to get upstairs to access the actual pool uh, so the ladies get nice little changing little uh, cubbies where the men are just given benches and locker rooms and lockers. So they're just thrown to change amongst themselves. I also believe that this is a big universal shower or urinal here. So again, slightly different on either side, but tailored to the needs of 1920s women and men. Again, also with the separate stairs on this side for men to get up to the pool. We can see that um, here in this archival photo, again, you can see that stairwell railing at the top of the pool. Here is a photograph of that interior loop that we're looking at here where the bathrooms and locker rooms would go before they're installed, um, which is a very unique glimpse. Um, one of the other interesting things about this picture is just you get a really good view of the windows that would have been to get into this section. Uh, the vast majority of the Bintz pools that have survived and are still standing and being used, the majority of them have had those windows replaced um, with either just bricked in and closed off completely or maybe glass block being put in for security reasons or some sort of other modern replacement of a window. But uh, this is a really great picture because it just shows how much light would come in through those windows. Obviously, this is these are being built starting in 1920 and onwards, so they obviously have electricity with them, um, but still seeing the need for large windows to let in space to this area. Here is an early um, promotional um, pamphlet that was distributed for the pools. It has the date on the bottom of 1926. Um, and so again, it highlights it has one of a recent pool being built on the top. And it lists out the advantages of the Vince swimming pool. There are 20. Uh, there are very kind of repetitive and basically say all the same things about how it's economical uh, and safe spacing, space, safe space saving. I can speak today um, and listing out why you should get that. Um, you can see in the corner it also says the municipal index in it. And that speaks to how as an engineer, as someone who worked in municipal settings before starting his business, he really knew who at the city needed to get this information to actually make this happen. So a lot of the outreach and publicity um, uh, that's made for these pools are really geared at municipal workers and not necessarily a public campaign that tries to get public appeal to build these pools. Here is a uh, advertisement, a drawing that was created a little bit later on in the history of the pools that is trying to sell and advertise how they could also create sunken pools. Um, most of the pools he built throughout the entire time period were those egg shaped above ground pools. There were some rectangular above ground pools that he built. Um, and they ranged in a variety of sizes. The majority of the pools um, were around 80 to 80 feet by 120. So let me just go back to this one. So it would be 80 uh, feet at that um, across and then 120 feet long. But as time went on, there was obviously because it's concrete, it can be altered so easily and, and changed up so easily. They could have smaller ones, quite larger ones, and then later on advertising these sunken pools. Um, at the top, it says, want a cheap sunken pool? You can write us for details and, and information on that. 
I think it's an also really interesting this um, drawing is that you know this big photograph the big drawing down here at the bottom and the top corner and the left you know is focusing on a city park swimming pool but then we look at these smaller vignette drawings here and, and this top one you know it says memorial pool on it but it's obviously for a smaller community so because you're a smaller community we can shape that and be a smaller pool so they have that variety and ability to change based on your needs once that first pool is completed and he's hit the ground running the photographs of that opening of that pool are really distributed across the country and um, picked up not just as noteworthy interesting look at this weird pool that was built but also as a means of pr and trying to gain interest in building these pools. So here we have the same exact PR shot, publicity shot that is printed by two different newspapers. The top one is from 1926 uh, from a Newburgh newspaper. And they've published this image specifically to mention and announce that Poughkeepsie had just been awarded, had just awarded a contract to build their own Bintz pool. And then the bottom, as you can see from the title, was printed in uh, Elmira newspaper in 1927, again, to announced that they are going to embark on building their own bins. And that's what this larger photograph is next to it. It is the group of men celebrating their uh, built, their completed Elmira pool um, in 1927, excuse me. In the articles of the day, they actually describe the pool, describe it saying that nothing had been left undone to make this pool the finest in all of the Southern tier. Uh, it's not in that condition currently, but it had a light, nice long life where it might have been the finest pool in the southern tier. And Tabitha, break in any time if there's questions. Um, okay, so on to publicity. So just with that 1923 opening day photograph that was distributed and printed in newspapers, um, throughout the 30s and 40s, there is a serious PR campaign to spread the joys of Bint's pools uh, to the masses. And so up here at the top, this clipping of a title, Why Wellsboro Built a Straw Hat Swimming Pool. Um, that was printed in 1939 in the issue uh, in the magazine, The American City. So The American City was a news uh, a journal that was published from uh, the turn of the century through 1940. And it was specifically geared for municipalities, for the professional industry, for engineers, for city public works officers, and, and really industry trade book. And there are many um, issues that have articles like this where it's basically just regurgitating those benefits from the 1926 brochure of why you should build a Benz pool, but from the point of view of the city engineer themselves. So you're getting a firsthand review of how it's amazing and why you should build it. The other great thing about this particular article is it does include this description of calling it a straw hat swimming pool and this really fabulous drawing illustrating what that means, because it is. It's just a turned up, a hat turned upside down, the inside of the hat is filled with water and then that brim hides all of the necessary um, elements for that pool. Um, in addition to this outreach through these professional trade journals and magazines, um, there is also um, a push and a conversation happening about living memorials, about using pools and recreation centers of other types as living memorials for those we lost during World War II. Uh, we didn't want the stuffy monuments of our grandfathers, we wanted something different. And so there are a lot of publications put out by governmental agencies and also trade groups and, and associations advocating using these recreation centers, centers to celebrate and commemorate that loss. And so this middle image, the color one is um, Memorials That Live. It was a brochure printed in 1944 by the federal government that suggests all and kind of goes through all the different types of recreation centers, including pools that you could build to celebrate and honor your servicemen. The bottom left this article that's what about our returning servicemen that was from a 1945 publication from the National Recreation Association. Um, again, also highlighting how these can be used as living memorials. 
uh, at the same time that all that is happening, there is also another push that's more so from the public than the government or trade organizations that are pushing for public pools because of drownings and racism. So drownings, first off, um, you know, because we all grew up, pretty much everyone on this call and watching right now grew up in a time where we had public pools and municipal pools free or neighborhood pools, neighbors that have pools. The idea of going and getting swimming lessons in the summertime is something that's completely normal and regular for most of us watching today. But before World War II, that is not happening. You're not having mass swimming lessons to teach people how to swim. And obviously the majority of swimming is happening in open water. So drownings are just incredibly common and incredible pro a problem. Um, I've never researched swimming before. This is my first time talking about this, but I know through my entire career of just randomly, you know, researching projects and looking through newspaper archives for information, I always run across articles talking about a drowning. Uh, it was incredibly uh, common. And so there is a, a push in the 20s, in the 30s to start creating these swimming pools so we can stop that loss. And that's what this publication here at top, the new swimming hole, it was produced by the state of Illinois, again, explaining why and, and the merits of building the a pool from that point of view and giving guidance to municipalities of how to create this new swimming hole for their communities. And then on the topic of racism, uh, you know, in 1919, it's it's known as, as the Red Summer of 1919, famously the Chicago race riots in July and August of that year started because of an in incident at a segregated beach. Um, there, that is not an isolated occurrence. There are, you know, dozens, if not hundreds of incidences where violence and tragedy started because of segregation or lack of segregation at public watering holes. And so pools were seen as a way to alleviate that, not in a way to peacefully allow everyone to occupy the same swimming space, but in the negative way into having this brick and mortar pool that it's a lot easier to regulate who can and can't be in that pool. I'm not saying that our memorial pool in North Tonawanda was built for that purpose. We know it was not. I'm not saying that all of the Bince pools were built for that purpose, but that is definitely an underlining reason for why so many communities do end up building pools. And we need to keep that in the back of our minds as we go forward. A question, Christy. Yes. Um, Ian asks, how many of the Bins pools still exist and of those, how many are still operational? That is a great question that we really don't have the answer for and is a perfect question as I started this slide. So great timing, actually. Um, we, you know, we can look through newspapers and find, you know, firsthand documentation that helps us kind of chart that out. And again, the name that I, I mentioned in the beginning, Tegan, uh, the architectural historian and preservationist, she's done a lot of work at researching and trying to, on her own, inventory and catalog these. But there has been no concerted effort um, from a state or um, regional or even a local organization to inventory and document all of these pools. So we really don't have a firm concrete number of, of what's still existing. I think the, the, the general idea is that there were about 130 built. Um, there are not 130 still standing. There really are just uh, not that many. I would say less than, less than two dozen, I would wanna say that are still standing. And even if they are still standing, that does not mean that they are functional. It does not mean that they are in operation condition. It doesn't mean that the entire um, facility is even still standing. There's a lot of examples where the bulk of the actual pool has been demoed, but they retained that entrance way because it was dramatic in some sort of way or, or that was what they wanted to keep from that pool. So unfortunately, I don't have an answer for you. And I'll talk about more about what we can do to solve that at the end. <laughs> so because there is not this massive index to be able to look through and categorize them, 
you know, when we look through all of the pictures that all of these wonderful people who love these and, and support them and, and want to keep them have shared on these online uh, communities, we can kind of see that general pattern and uh, in grouping of the different styles. Because again, it's, it's, as we learned and saw from the patent application, the basic thing is that it's just a big inverted hat filled with concrete with pools and locker rooms around it. But the decorative elements, the architectural style to it varied greatly depending on the pool. So in um, not having some sort of greater survey that tells us what era these happened with or categorize them, I present to you my goofy attempt at categorizing all of the Vince pools. Um, so the first grouping is going to be what I'm calling the modernistic styles the modernistic pools. So again, the, the basic circle of the pool is going to be basically identical for every pool that's built. The structure, the general uh, division of these partitions around the circle, but it's this main entrance that really is different for every pool. So we have these modernistic ones. They exhibit characteristics of art modern and art deco styles. Um, these ones all seem to be um, popular and, and built in the 1930s, in the late 1930s. And almost all of them that I've seen and come across through the different affinity groups um, were built as WPA projects. Uh, WPA uh, is not a Cardi B song. It is the Workers' Progress Administration. It was a, um, a, a part of the New Deal during the Great Depression that put millions of Americans to work building public works projects. And so these are great examples of public works projects. The top um, photograph here is the Harmon Field swimming pool that was built in um, Chafee, Missouri. Um, it was built 1937 to 1939 as a WPA project. This middle one that has a fabulous, much more art modern influenced entrance. And I say it's more art modern because of just the repetitiveness of this circle, this curve in it. Uh, art deco elements had curves in it and we see a curve in the entrance ways of the other two. Um, but really this one is like super more art modern. <laughs> this one is an outliner. It's actually outlier. It's built in 1952. It's in Boise, Idaho. Boise, Idaho actually can brag because they have two Bintz pools and both of them are incredibly loved by the community and actively taken care of by the city. So those two pools are both open and available to the public. But again, it was built in 1952 and not as a WPA project. Here on the right hand side in the corner, we have the Bangor Park swimming pool in Bangor, Pennsylvania. Um, it was built in 1937, again, as a WPA project. Um, sadly, the pool itself has been demolished, um, but they did retain the entranceway. And then it was kind of standing alone for a while, but now they have built a, a new building that uses that entranceway as its entranceway. The bottom right, we have the Gingrich Memorial Pool in Pen Gingrich, Pennsylvania. I believe it's Gingrich, Pennsylvania. Uh, that was built in 1939. And then down here, I included a close up of a photograph of Memorial Pool of our North Tonawanda pool that was taken on its opening day to show how the current entrance is not that way. We'll see more pictures later on, but to show how the original entrance of ours was this art deco, this modernistic design. Um, but our pool again was built in 1948 and was not a WPA project. Um, so again, some out, some not totally consistent with the thirties, but many of them were built in the thirties as WPA projects. Uh, the next two groupings uh, are uh, this bottom one here is what I'm going to be calling organic. Um, so these pools are, are the first generation of the Bintz pools. So they are a lot more kind of simple in a way in those extra details of the concrete and brick that surround the circle of the pool. Um, but how they distinguish themselves is through that application of cobblestone on the exterior. So it's the brick, it's the concrete building. They might be some brick cladding on the exterior as well, but that um, inlaying of cobblestone uh, gives it its distinctive look. Also, these ones that are built, that first generation built in the late 20s that have that cobblestone exterior, 
these are the ones that are more often the ones built into hills and into interesting topography. Again, kind of capitalizing on that idea that it's built into the nature and, and just plopped there. And that cobblestone really gives it that connection. Uh, uh, the top photo is what I'm calling the, the boat deck kind, <laughs> for lack of a better phrase. These pools came with a double deck on top of the entrance. So this right below here is the main entrance to get into the pool that would take you through the loops of the locker room. And then we have this double layer uh, decking above it. Um, uh, this double decker uh, pool here is the Brand Memorial Park pool in Elmira. Uh, the original Elmira pool that was built uh, was demolished or, or I think was actually damaged in a flood. And so then in 1949, they built this one uh, that has uh, definitely seen better days currently. And then this bottom picture, the organic one, I forgot to mention where this one was from. This is the Camps Humson Memorial Swimming Pool in Pontiac, Illinois. It was built in 1925. Uh, there are similar pools that, are, are, that look like that. The prototype pool that we saw, the J.H. Moore um, Natatorium in Lansing, that definitely has that organic feel with the inlaid cobblestones. And also the athletic park pool um, in Indiana that was built in 1925 also has that organic feel to it. And then the last kind of general category that has a lot more variation in the individual elements on that pool, as you can see, even from these two photographs that have one has an incredibly large, um, more complex entranceway, and, and the one on top has something a little bit more simple. Uh, but I'm calling this, for lack of a better phrase, <laughs> institutional brick art deco. Um, when we look at the patterns and the decorative qualities and elements of how the brick and how the concrete is laid out on the exterior, it definitely has some art deco-ish elements to it, but that brick kind of tricks our mind into not thinking that it's Art Deco. Um, it just really kind of looks like a lot of 1940s, 1950s um, school buildings, elementary schools that were built. So just that very institutional kind of feel to it of an of a early mid-century. Uh, these seem to be more popular in the 1930s, but again, just like with the other examples, there are ones that are built outside of those time periods. The two that we see on the screen before us, the top one is the Margaret Manson Weir Memorial Pool that's in West Virginia, and then the bottom one is the Cuscaden Park Pool in Tampa, Florida that was built in 1937. The top one was built in 1934. Any questions before we move on to talk about our pool in North Tonawanda? Spectacular. <laughs> okay, so back to our pool again. Um, so here you can see now that we've looked through all those styles and we come back to this pool, you can see how this front entrance is that modernistic style. And ours was not painted. Those other examples had been painted who knows if they were painted originally when they were constructed and in that time period, or if they were painted today to just jazz them up a little bit. But here we have photographic evidence that ours in that time period wasn't um, painted. And I, again, just the, the best part about this photograph is just all the bicycles strewn in the yard. No cares in the world if someone's going to take it and really just shows how beloved and used this pool was that everyone in the neighborhood just rode their bikes to go hang out at the pool. So when did this happen? How did this come across? Um, so North Tonawanda had for some time been working on the idea of building a public pool. It's not until November of 1945 that they finally kind of get all on the same page and decide to sign a contract with Vince. Um, it's in this article. Um, I found other articles too, but in this article, you can see that it actually quotes that there are 73 other pools in the United States. I think we've all read newspaper articles that had wrong information in it. So I would hope that that's true, but we would need some more evidence to really confirm that number. Um, in the rest of the article, obviously not included on this picture, but in the rest of the article, it talks about how Bince actually had to testify, had to, uh, was at the meeting with 
the city council and discussed why his pool was going to be great and how it would move forward and all the logistics and stuff. And he even says that if you know we can get on track and everybody working keep to a tight schedule, they would be able to start construction that following April and then have the pool open in June of 1946. That doesn't happen, obviously. They might sign the contract in 1945, but by September 1946, the city is still working on trying to go through the bids of the contractor for the pool. So while Bince would be hired to design and supervise construction of the building of the pool, he did not actually have his own construction crew that came in and did the construction. He wasn't a one-stop shop. You paid him for the design and his project management, you still would have to hire a contractor to be the actual builder of the pool. And so even, you know, a year later, we're still having some kind of bickerings um, amongst uh, the council and prospective contractors, and certainly amongst the council members themselves. Uh, some things never change. I'm sure some of you are laughing right now. Um, there was a lot of arguments about the expense that they just thought that they were asking too much money to just build the pool. It's just a pool. Why should it be that much money? In this article, they imply that the contractor that they are going to select is a group called Fago Construction out of Buffalo. Um, but uh, as we learn later on through subsequent and later articles, they're actually not the group that is eventually chosen. It's a contractor, a very small contractor shop, a, a company out of Tonawanda that is ultimately hired to build the pool. Um, so fast forward to August 1947, excuse me, we do have construction started and we're at the point where we can have a dedication ceremony. So that happens um, in August and the guest of honor for that is Robert Kippeth. Kippeth? I've, I have no idea if I'm saying that correctly. <laughs> I apologize. He was a North Tonawanda native and he was um, rose to national prominence during this time period as the Olympic swimming coach uh, for the United States. And he also um, was the main coach and uh, they referred to him as the mentor of the Yale swimming program. So he was very, very well known and respected on a national and international level for swimming. And he came from North Tonawanda. So he came back home, not only to do the dedication ceremony for the pool, um, but also to have, to be, um, to preside, I guess is the word, over the Golden Jubilee Cross River Swim that happened in his honor, the first annual, that was a one and a half mile swim across the river between the Tonawandas. Um, so he dedicated the, paint, the pool on Payne Avenue to the 3,416 men and women of North Tonawanda who served in World War II. And we see this is, the plaque that is applied um, as part of that dedication ceremony. So we have the dedication ceremony, construction continues through 1947, but it's not until 1948 that the pool is completed and open to the public. Um, they have a unveiling ceremony and event in December of 47, I assume before the snow got too bad, um, that allowed citizens to just come in like an open house to check out the pool um, before its formal opening in the summer. Uh, it, the article notes how the 120 foot by 80 foot pool had 40 ribbed glass windows um, and covered an area of 450 square feet. It had 848 lockers, uh, those 36 changing stalls for the delicate women of that era, and then just the rows of benches for the men. There were a total of 28 showers, six restrooms, and uh, what also makes this special is that there were two sets of restrooms. So there were restrooms that were used just, that were accessible only for um, swimmers, so those would be wet bathrooms and then there were special dry bathrooms so that those who are not swimming and just watching could use those without getting uh, the pool water on them and then certainly those were bathrooms that were available for the rest of the park anyone else in the park that needed to use the restrooms so they provided a service to the greater park as well not just the swimmers 
um, this article and pretty much every article about the pool in its first couple of years also mentioned how it had 23 floodlights built in. The idea of nocturnal swimming was very, very big. Um, and they were very happy to use these lights to turn night into day for nocturnal swimmers. Here we have on uh, the right hand side these two photographs that were printed in the Buffalo News uh, in June of 1948, um, documenting the opening day. Uh, I am going to be honest, I'm very confused on what day the opening day would be, because in the same paper, they uh, refer to it as being the first swimmers on Tuesday and also in a separate location, the first swimmers on Monday. So it could have been June the 29th or June the 28th. I have no idea, no <laughs> consistency in that. But here we have a really great photo, again, showing that original entrance that was on it, that modernistic entrance um, with its curved panels here. Again, really interesting because this is not painted uh, where the other ones are painted and the other ones have um, accented vertical lines incorporated into that painting, where here it almost looks like it's a grid. So I don't know if that is glass blocks or if it's just the brick that's been painted or applied in a way that's decorative, but just a really interesting vantage point of that entrance from this way. And then here, the best part about the bins pools is that they would have windows to look into the swimmers. And so you know, obviously the windows that we see here from the main photograph on the exterior, those windows would go into the locker rooms into the bathroom and what. But on that interior wall of the pool accessible to those in the locker room or into the entrance way, really, you would have these little windows that you could open to check out the swimming <laughs> happening, which is not only cool and gimmicky, but also probably really helpful from a, a public safety point of view that you'd be able to see better what's going on at the bottom of the pool um, in, in case of an emergency or something like that. Excellent. Here is an image of the original rules and regulations of the pool. Uh, pretty standard rules for swimming. Um, and then here is the visual of the um, from the Sanborn map. Sanborn fire insurance maps are made for pretty much every municipality in the United States um, to help with not only um, fire insurance, but used for a variety of uh, reasons. And so here we see the pool um, in Payne Park. And it was also built uh, adjacent to a, a wading pool for smaller children. Uh, the the um, Bince pools would have a deepest depth. This pool had a deepest depth of 11 feet to it. So it really wasn't um, that great for small, small children to swim in that pool. Uh, once it's opened again, like that, that oh yeah. We have a question. Sorry. Yeah, this is a question from Kathy. Were lifeguards always present at these pools? Uh, I mean, honestly, that would be a decision for the municipality. But yes, I would assume that there would always be um, lifeguards. Again, the idea of building this municipal pool, this brick and mortar place for people to pool swim, it was a way to not only regulate who could and could not come in, you could charge residents or not charge residents, charge visitors, not charge visitors, and then also offer that public safety aspect of it. So you would have um, uh, lifeguards. I, if I scroll back for a bit, you can see even, you know, in a lot of the historic photos, archival photos, where you'll see the stations and chairs for the lifeguards to sit into. Um, I didn't pay attention to that picture all the way at the beginning from the Lansing pool if it had um, lifeguards in it. But yes, I would assume they would have lifeguards. Good question. Um, again, like that original photo with all the bikes in the yard, um, this pool is loved and, and very popular and well used from day one. And it's not just for just recreational swimming and hanging out. They also staged and it was large enough even with its egg shape to it, it still was used for races. Uh, it still could be used for races. And so here we have September of 48, they have their first Labor Day regatta. So we just had the anniversary of the first Labor Day regatta um, in the pool. And then uh, that following year, the second year that it's opened, we have a sports carnival happening there, which who doesn't want to be a part of a carnival? I sure would want to be part of a carnival. Um, again, with a super great photo showing all of these people, just the massive people that would be attending these types of events. 
Um, and then I wanted to just include this photograph uh, from September 50 of that, the end of that second season of the pool being open, showing how the city is doing that um, preventative maintenance and taking an upkeep of this pool, getting it ready uh, for winter, uh, but also really cute because it's a little, made the kids a little sad because I guess the, um, the weather was quite good that week, but it was time to close it up. So they had to sweep it out and fix out the drain. From 1950 moving forward, the pool is well loved and, and popular. Um, there's, you know, a couple of mentions throughout the years in newspapers of annual reports being produced um, by the Parks and Rec Department in North Tonawanda, talking about all the different visitors at the different amenities that they have, and the pool always has high numbers on that. Um, in 1955, there was an article, again, citing the usage of different parks and, and park uh, amenities, and they calculated that on average, 1,300, over 1,300 children use the Payne Memorial Pool daily for 72 consecutive days. So that's a thousand, over, you know, almost 15, you know, over a thousand people coming every day to use this pool. And we're talking about a time period when the population still was not that much. It was rising. The peak population that North Tonawanda ever had was, I think, 36,000. Um, in 1970 or 1960. So we're definitely on the, the increase in 1955 of that population, but that is a large number for how small the community was. So really, really well-loved um, pool. Fast forward to 1984. Um, you know, I think a lot of communities hit some hard budget years in the 70s and the late 70s. Um, and so by 1984, there is just a need for a significant renovation and upkeep and, and just remont, you know, uh, renovation of the pool. Um, so they announced that estimating that it's going to cost about 100 to $200,000 to do everything that it's needed. Um, there's a lot of discussion and, and controversy about where this money is going to come from. Um, as you see in this article here, it even says point blank, it hinges on receiving federal funding to cover it. Um, there's some arguments and discussion about, well, if we don't get the federal funding to fix it, what are we going to do? But thankfully, uh, they do get uh, awarded funding from the federal government to do this necessary work. And so as part of this um, upgrade project to the pool. They repair the main drain because there's some leakage happening. They resurface the pool floor and the deck, and then they installed new lockers and accessibility alterations. That accessibility alteration most namely is removing the original entranceway um, to the current entranceway, uh, which has a more accessible uh, manner to access that decking. Uh, so a great thing for accessibility and making sure that the pool is continued to be used, but certainly a step backwards in preserving the integrity of that pool. Um, so it's, it's a rather unfortunate change there. Um, I did try very hard to find documentation and records of what happened to the original entranceway. If, um, if it was just literally taken to a dumpster and, and chiseled up and thrown away, or if maybe it was taken off and, and kept by someone, I sure know I would try my, <laughs> my darndest to get that thing kept somewhere because it is just really freaking cool looking, right? It's freaking cool looking. <laughs> um, so that is, you know, there haven't been that many changes to the pool, but this is certainly a major alteration to the pool. Other than that, the only other two major alterations to the, the construction of the pool was the addition of this freaking cool slide, curly, curly slide. That's what we see here on the right-hand side. That's the, North, uh, the Memorial Pool in North Tonawana, just showing how they installed it here. And then uh, to the left of it is a slide that was installed at the um, athletic park pool in Anderson, Indiana. Again, just kind of showing how adding these more elaborate pools or more elaborate um, diving boards or alterations to the diving boards was something that was very common with these pools as trends and fashions and, and wants and needs of the community changed through the years. 
And then the other major change that has happened to the pool over the years is the infill of those exterior windows. So again, we can zoom in on that fabulous bicycle picture and see these windows that are a combination of, um, you know, with six lights in the main block here, and then either some sort of glass block flanking either uh, side, or maybe just a smaller paned window pane. Um, it's, you know, hard to tell from this vantage point, certainly. Uh, currently, it's just blocked in and filled with glass blocks to allow for those venting, the vents. Um, not the worst way to close them up, but certainly not something that uh, can't be removed and to be able to allow to restore those original windows that were in place. So Memorial Pool today, uh, these are two really, really great photographs um, that I found on the Bintz um, Facebook group. Um, so thank you to whoever posted those. I know that the one on the right is from um, nthistory.com um, and it was taken by Dennis Reed and it's just a really dynamic, awesome photograph. The pool was opened um, in 2019 for swimmers. Uh, by now, it has a small entrance fee for a residence to be able to go swimming, um, but uh, quite nominal compared to other um, area municipal swimming pools. Uh, obviously, did not open this year because of COVID. Um, but as with many other small municipalities here in Western New York, North Tonawanda is facing a, a budget crisis. Um, they, the pool has not been a moneymaker for quite some time, if ever, quite honestly. And so the pool, the city is really having some really hard hitting, tough conversations about whether or not we want to keep opening and operating this pool, if we want to keep it standing, do we want to demolish it? Do we want to replace it? And just kind of exploring all those options because um, from their point of view currently, um, it's not sustainable to keep operating it. So as part of that project and right before quarantine happened, they did release a feasibility study that was done um, by brand setter Carol Inc. And in this study, they really just analyzed two options. Um, what would, how much and what would go into just fixing the pool as it is now for continued use, and then replacing the pool with a real fancy pants water park, all accessible municipal water facility of some sort. And so you can see kind of a rough uh, drawing down here of how that would uh, lay out in the park um, with the other elements that are there. They estimate in this feasibility study that just to repair and get it to where it needs to be, it would be $2.5 million. And that would just get it to fix all the, uh, the items that need to be fixed, all the immediate concerns. Uh, that would not, um, afford for continued maintenance of it. They estimate um, that they would continue to lose and have been losing about $80,000 a year on the operation of this pool. So it's, it's definitely not a money maker. Um, the other option that this feasibility study really focuses on is that water park. They estimate that that would cost $6.5 million to build. Um, and they kind of see it as not just something to meet the needs and replacement of the Bintz pool, but as a moneymaker for, um, for the region, that it would be something that not only residents would be able to go to, but non-residents would be able to pay an entrance fee to go. So it would be a moneymaker for the city to pursue this water park idea. Um, I think it's important to mention and discuss how in all of the conversations that you see about the pool, the overwhelming feeling is that it's loved and it wants to be kept and retained. The community wants to see it. And also I found it interesting that it often mentioned how um, other parks department amenities also operate with yearly deficits um, and often operate in the red, um, like the golf course. But the golf course is not actively under threat of being removed, but this pool that is well loved and attended by neighborhood by the neighborhood isn't getting that same appreciation. So those are interesting conversations happening amongst um, the citizens of North Tonawanda. Um, so that brings us to you know the preservation of Vince pools. And so when we talk about the preservation of Vince pools, um, there's kind of a two 
sided two parts of that conversation. So there's going to be the grassroots ground level advocacy efforts to physically save that pool that's under threat or underused. And so we have two examples of that with these Facebook groups that have been created again the Coalition to Save Memorial Pool in North Tonawanda, a group of concerned citizens are on there, you know, spreading their love and, and, and desire to have the pool retained and repaired and, and kept as part of our built environment. And then here is one that's a group in the Lansing, in Lansing, Michigan, for the original Vince Pool, the Moores Pool, that's advocating for that pool um, and retaining that pool and keeping that pool in their community. So there's there's a lot of work from the local level with local advocacy groups to work and address that individual pools issue. But I think the greater conversation that needs to be held and 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 pushed forward by us who are appreciate <laughs> who love and appreciate these pools is a more concerted and, and organized effort on a state and national level to try and inventory and survey all these pools. Um, so as the question before about how many are there, you know, we really don't have good concrete numbers. How do we get good and concrete numbers? Uh, normally how we would do that is through survey work. And so normally how a survey would work, um, you would pick a geographic area, whether it's a neighborhood or a side of town or a whole municipality or a region, you would survey that region, study the history of that region, uh, identify the um, significant resources that are in that region. And then that document, that survey document would be kind of your roadmap towards preparing national register nominations, either for historic districts that are found to be um, eligible through that survey work or individual buildings or other resources. But when we talk about Bince pools, yeah, there are a couple of communities and states that have clusters of Bince pools. I mentioned how Boise has two. Michigan certainly has many Bince pools. I think the most of any state. Um, there's a couple uh, that are close to each other in, in Tampa and in Florida. And here in New York, there once was a cluster here in the southern tier and into western New York. But there aren't so many that we could do some sort of individual survey. If we were to start a survey of Vince pools here, there would only just be a couple. So we need to do a statewide survey of these pools. And that's where this image on the left hand comes through. Um, that's a guideline from the National Park Service of how to complete the National Register form that's called a multiple property documentation form. So what this type of document would do is allow you on a state level to, I mean, it could possibly be a, a national level, but it's a lot easier just to go state by state where you would study and write about the history of Bins pools, how Bins pools affected and um, uh, happened and were built in the state and then prepare that inventory of all the bins pools in the state, not only where they are, but all the details and, and elements, you know, inventory that building to describe it and, and document it. Um, and then it would define, you know, what is a bins pool. And so then this document would be used to create national register nominations for those individual pools where individually it would be very difficult to get those things. If we were able to, as advocates and as community organizations, get together and create these documents, then we could have a multiple property documentation form for every state so we can easily pull up where are all the Vinces in New York, where are all the Vinces in Pennsylvania. That would be an incredible tool for us. Why would it be an incredible tool? Why would we want to list these pools on the National Register? Um, the National Register of Historic Places is our official listing from the federal government of all of the historic resources in the nation that are significant either on a local, a state, or a national level to our history. Not only are they significant, but they're worthy of preservation. Why do we want to get Bince pools listed on the National Register. Unfortunately, the National Register does not provide protection. It wouldn't avoid or stop the demolition or other bad things from happening to those pools. What listing on the National Register would do, though, is open the door to financial incentives. So by being listed on that National Register, you would be able to access particular grouping of grants for nonprofits and municipalities to be able to get money to 
do those necessary improvements. And it would also open the door to historic tax credits to allow for unique private and public partnerships to get those necessary upgrades and improvements needed to keep those pools not just only not just in our community, but still active and used in our communities. So from the point of view of what's next, we've learned this incredible history. We've dipped our toe into the story of Vince Pools to really kind of fully understand this. We need to do this extra survey and documentation so that we can ensure the ones that we have remain in our built environment. And that, my friends, is the end of my presentation. Uh, again, it would be infinitely longer if we had all this extra de details and more um, academic um, formal documentation of these resources. Um, so there is a lot of room for further work when it comes to Vince Pools. Are there any other last questions before I free you to the evening to have dinner and drinks and fun things that you might do in your house? Because obviously we can't go anywhere. <laughs> There is one more question from yeah. Kristen Derby. Oh, have you come across any Vince pools in your research that have received state or federal historic grants to make improvements or be adapted to a new use? Yes, I think uh, through my research, the majority of the articles that actually had good information in them were all pools that had already been listed on the National Register and because of that were getting state or federal monies to do those improvements. This, many of them, I think uh, most of them in Michigan have all received some sort of state or federal funding through historic preservation designations to do those improvements. Uh, the ones in Florida uh, and Tampa definitely did get a combination of public and private money to do those repairs. Um, yes, definitely. It would be very, very possible for that. And again, I think especially with what where we find ourselves right now and there were so you know whatever budgeting issues existed before moving into this post-covid pandemic life that we're going to be going into we're going to have a lot more uh, budgeting issues and so to be able to reach for all the available grant funding that you can to provide improvements and wonderful amenities for your community, it would just be a no brainer to try to get these things listed on national registers to try to get this extra survey work so we can get these designations to these pools so we can possibly try to get that funding. Um, a few more questions. Yeah, yeah, go for it. Lauren, Lauren Schulte asks if you have recommendations on how the pool could be made profitable so it could stay open or is um, the problem a lack of use because so many people have their own pools now? That's a really interesting question. I mean, definitely that, you know, there's nothing to fix that last part of that question. You know, people who have their own pools, we're, we're not gonna get them to come to a public pool in the way that people who don't have their own pools are gonna come to a public pool. I think it's all a matter of marketing and, and proper planning for this resource. Um, you know, proper management of these resources. If you, you know, if we take it away from, if we ignore the fact that this is like a municipality and something that's publicly owned, if you were a private owner and you bought your own pool and you had your own country club or you had your own place, how would you market this to try to get people to come? How, what amenities would you provide to make people come? I mean, that's what they did in the 80s when they added the, um, handicap accessible entrance to get into the pool. They added the twirly slide on it, adding these little things to get on there. But I think again, a, a more steady proper management of a pool, you know, right now, everything is about branding. Um, even when it comes to municipal uh, endeavors, if you have a cool gimmick, you have a cool logo, you have a, a cool whatever the what, <laughs> that also helps get attention. Um, I know that in my community growing up, I, I'm from outside Albany, um, from the suburbs outside Albany, and we had a public pool. Uh, it was not, unfortunately, a Benz pool. It was a much more conventional in-ground pool uh, complex, um, but every year that pool gets a dollar more expensive uh, to offset what the city's 
uh, what the you know, municipal government couldn't uh, cover on that operating cost, or when they added extra amenities, a larger sandwich shop or snack shop, then that fee would go up every year to account for that. Obviously, tiered um, entrance fees are one of like the biggest ways that municipal pools go to fund that. It's very, very cheap for residents of the community to go there, if not free, but if you don't live here, you have to pay a, a nice little chunk to be able to have the privilege and, and luxury of coming into our pool. Next. Lauren, Lauren says we should do a regular food truck day or craft show. Oh yeah, I mean, there's infinite number. Those are super, super freaking great ideas. Um, but also just like getting the word out. I think that there's so many things that our municipalities have, uh, not just when it comes to amenities like this, but just actual programs that are available. They're not thinking of it in a PR way, the same way that a business person would be thinking of how do I get the word out about this. So I think that in this regard, when it comes to public works, when it comes to public recreation, you really have to think like you are a business owner and you want to publicize it. So making sure that the, the community does know if you have someone who is new to North Tonawanda, maybe lives on the other side of town, doesn't ever really drive by Payne Avenue, how are they going to know that this is something that's accessible for them? How are you getting the word to all of your citizens that this is here for you? Food trucks are always great. People love food trucks. <laughs> um, and one more question for the moment. Jeff asks if there are any other Bince pools you came across within a short drive from Buffalo. The Elmira one, the uh, within a short, oh gosh, off the top of my head, I can't remember now. Jeff, you're killing me. <laughs> um, there were a couple. I don't remember seeing anything particularly there was close. Central New York, there were like two or three. Rochester had one. It was in a country club though. And I believe that it has been demolished now. Yeah, I really don't think, I think it's just the Elmira one that's the closest, that's either still standing or within a reasonable driving period, which is that isn't even still reasonable driving period. The ones in Pennsylvania might be closer, but I didn't really pay attention to where in Pennsylvania those were. You stumped me, Jeff, thanks. <laughs> And that's the last of the questions, unless right. anyone has any more. Well, friends, I had a great time talking about pools. Um, and this was, like I said in the beginning, our second lecture is part of Modern WNY 2020. Um, our next lecture is tomorrow about Lustron houses. Um, I'll say in the last kind of plug about why we need to do more advocacy about memorial pools, one of the reasons why we know so much about Lustrons and where they are and what's left is because so many states have done those multiple property documentation forms for Lustron houses. So I can kind of list out where are the Lustrons here in New York State because of that document. So we're gonna learn about Lustrons tomorrow. And then independent of the, uh, the construct of time, um, we have our self-guided tours available to you. So we have our Drive Yourself Mod, it's a self-guided driving tour of the region. Uh, each year we pick a new slot, uh, a slate, of interesting modern masterpieces. And so you have a new set of 14, I think it is now, 14 modern masters across the region to tour. And then Delaware Acres is a self-guided walking tour of the neighborhood just north of Delaware Park um, and tours the mid-century uh, masterpieces in that neighborhood. And you can get registration info for tomorrow's Lustron lecture, lecture and to purchase the brochure, the keepsake brochures with the map um, on our website, www.preservationbuffaloniagara.org. And with that, I am going to mute myself and turn my camera off. But if there are any more questions, feel free, free to put them into the chat so we can answer them. And hopefully uh, see you tomorrow, uh, 6 p.m. for our Lustron talk. I'm going to tell you now, I'm definitely going to have a cocktail during that lecture because it's Friday. <laughs> So thank you so much for joining us and have a great rest of your week and see you tomorrow.